Okay, let's see if we can slog our way through liquidating distributions. All right, so the issues here are basically to determine whether the terminating partner recognizes gain or loss. In most cases, uh, they don't recognize either a gain or loss, but in some, some circumstances, they do. And the other issue is uh, to determine whether or not the uh, terminating partner needs to reallocate um, the basis, their outside basis, to the distributed assets. I mean, I say whether uh, they have to, and so how they handle it depends on really whether or not um, the outside basis is greater than the inside basis or it's less than the inside basis. And it also depends on the mix of property distributed to the terminating partner. And so the rationale behind the rules for liquidating distributions is simply to replace the partner's outside basis with the underlying partnership assets distributed to the terminating partner. They try to make this as seamless as possible. Again, you're you're simply uh, placing an asset that was in the hands of the partnership back into a partner's hands. So for the most part, they try to make that fairly seamless. Now in theory, there would be no gain or loss on the distribution, and that's true in most cases, but not all cases. And the asset bases would be the same in the partner's hands as they were inside the partnership. However, this rarely occurs because outside basis and inside basis uh, don't always equal. Many times they don't. So the rules are designed to determine when gain or loss must be recognized and to allocate the, the partner's outside basis to the distributed assets. So gain or loss recognition in uh, liquidating distribution. Uh, generally, partners and partnerships do not recognize gain or loss, as I said. Um, the exception, as far as gains are concerned, is that the partner gain, uh, recognizes a gain when the uh, partnership distributes money and the amount exceeds the partner's outside basis in the partnership interest. And again, this outside basis has to be reduced by any debt relief as a result of their liquidation. So you start with their outside basis and then you reduce uh, that outside basis by the amount of debt relief that the, the liquidating partner is going to have from getting out of the partnership <clears throat> and then you compare that remaining outside basis with the amount of money received and if, if uh, the amount exceeds the partner's remaining outside basis then they're going to recognize a gain. Now, partner recognizes loss only when two, two, two conditions are met. First, the distribution consists of only cash uh, and hot assets, and the partner's outside basis exceeds the sum of the bases of the distributed assets. If you look at these scenarios, that would be scenario... Um, one, I believe. Yeah. Scenario one. The, the gain thing was actually, um, go back to that. 
that would be scenario three. Okay, if you're looking at the scenarios. But in, in all these other cases, scenario two, four, and five, there is no gain or loss. You simply allocate the remaining basis after um, allocating to cash first, money first, you've got to deal with the remaining basis after that. Um, so, basis in distributed property. The primary objective is to allocate the partner's entire outside basis in the partnership to the assets the partner receives in the liquidating distribution. The allocation essentially depends on two things. The partnership's bases in the distributed, distributed assets relative to, to the partner's outside basis and the type of property distributed. It depends on whether it's money, hot assets, or uh, other types of property other than money or hot, and or hot assets. And so here's your scenarios that I referred to. We already talked about uh, scenario one and three, scenarios one and three. <clears throat> Scenario one was the loss situation, and scenario three was the gain situation. But here, here is another uh, example of scenario one. Partners, and they put some numbers in here, partners outside basis is greater than partners inside basis. Okay, and so you have scenario one where there's distributions of money, inventory, and or uh, unrealized receivables, a.k.a. hot assets. And so in this situation, Greg has an outside basis of 334000 but he um, has share of liabilities of 66000 so in a liquidating distribution, he receives $159,000 cash and in inventory with a fair market value of $49,000. Will, will Greg recognize a gain or a loss? And if you look at uh, 21-16, That's this exact same problem. And so the answer, of course, is that uh, he will recognize a capital loss of $60,000. And so says here, uh, yes, to prevent the conversion of a capital loss to an ordinary loss, Greg recognizes a $60,000 capital loss. If the inventory distributed to Greg is also considered inventory in his hands, the eventual sale of the inventory will generate ordinary income, true. So, I mean, somewhere down the line, if he sells it as an or, uh, ordinary income uh, asset, not only did he get screwed originally because he has a capital loss instead of, instead of an ordinary loss, when he eventually sells this inventory, he's going to get screwed again because his uh, income is going to be ordinary, not capital. So. You know, with the IRS, as you've seen before, it's heads, uh, IRS wins, and tails, taxpayer loses. So, not a big surprise, huh? <clears throat> um, they, they note here that if the, in, uh, 
if the inventory is a capital asset to Greg, the sale of the asset within uh, five years of the distribution will generate ordinary income, even though it's a capital asset to him. Because when he got it, it was um, inventory to the partnership. And if you look um, on page 22, they talk about that. Um, in other words, it keeps its ordinary income taint for five years after the distribution. If it's sold within that five years, even, even if it's held as a uh, uh, capital asset in Greg's hands, um, after the distribution from the partnership, if he sells it, it's still going to be ordinary income. It holds its taint for five years. After the five years, capital uh, gain or loss will be capital. So um, the moral of that story is for Greg to hold on to the inventory for um, five, at least five years in one day and then sell it so it could be a capital gain or loss, especially if it's capital gain. Of course, if, if it's ordinary loss, he's already taken the loss. So anyway, don't want to get too bogged down in that. All right. Um, two, four, and five is where it gets a little bit sticky. Okay, so hold on here. And so again, partner's outside basis is greater than the inside basis of distributed assets. So that's the scenario, or that's the setup. And so in scenario two, not only is money and possibly hot assets distributed, but other property is included in the distribution. <clears throat> and so in this case, the partner allocates the entire outside basis to the distributed as assets. The partner may increase the bases of any other property, but does not recognize a gain or loss. Notice that um, they do not increase the bases of hot assets, just the other property. And so the procedure for this is... Um, step one, assign outside basis to distributed assets in the amount equal to the assets inside basis. And then step two, allocate the required increase to assets with unrealized appreciation. We'll see an example here in a minute. And then step three, you allocate any remaining required increase um, in other words, any remaining uh, allocation goes to the distributed assets of the other property in proportion to their relative fair market values. And so the, the formula is, for the basis allocation is required basis that remains that's got to be allocated times the fair market value of the asset divided into the sum of the fair market value of uh, all, all the other property, including the property you're, you're allocating to. So anyway, it'll make sense here in a second. So again, back to our example. Um, so CCS here makes the following distribution to Greg in liquidation of his CCS interest. So he gets cash, investment A, investment B, and inventory. So cash and inventory are, uh, of course, cash is cash, and then inventory is a hot asset. And investment A and B are considered other property. So, again, he's got a uh, 
basis, outside basis, of 334000 he's going to be relieved of 66000 of CCS's liabilities, so he reduces his outside basis by the 66000 so the remaining basis is 268000 It says, what is Greg's recognized gain or loss? That's not going to be any. What is Greg's basis in the distributed assets following the liquidation? So the answer is no gain or loss um, as far as the, the allocation, the answer is cash, the face value of 181. For inventory, it's going to be the inside basis of 43. And then for our other property, that's where we're going to allocate the remaining uh, inside basis based upon the relative values of investment A or B and B, the other property. Okay, so um, anyway, down here they've reduced his Greg's uh, outside basis by the debt relief. And so the allocable basis is the 268000 And then initially, you've got your step one. They allocate that 268 first to cash, 181 Then to inventory, the hot asset, 43 And then the initial basis assigned to investment A is 5 That's the... Um, tax basis, right? And then um, for investment B, the tax basis is ten thousand. So you you take one eighty one four forty three five and ten out of the two sixty eight, and what you have remaining to allocate is $29,000 and that $29,000 is going to be allocated to the other property investment A and B. And so in step two, what we do is we allocate the appreciation in those other property assets and again that's uh, What twelve thousand? The difference between five thousand, the the tax basis, and the fair market value. So, the fair market value of investment A is twelve. So you increase the five by seven, and then the tax basis of investment B was ten and the fair market value is 13, so you increase that investment by three, and what you have remaining left of the allocable CCS basis after step two is uh, the 29,000 minus the seven and the three, or uh, $19,000. So, this is how we allocate that remaining $19,000. You're going to take the, the value of investment A of $12,000, the fair market value, and the total value of both investment A and B is uh, 25 combined, right? $12,000 plus $13,000, so $25,000. And so you're going to div divide... Uh, 12,000 into 25,000 then then multiply that times the remaining allocable basis of 19 and what you come up with is 9,120 and you do the same for uh, investment B and that's how you allocate that remaining $19,000 and you see there at the bottom uh, the total allocation the initial basis then we include the uh, appreciation 
there in step two and then, then the allocation in step three. <coughs> All right, again, scenario three where you have, and again, we're changing it up here, partner's outside basis is less, not more than the inside basis of distributed assets. And so in this case, it's just like with uh, di operating distributions of, of money only. It's going to be a gain. You're simply going to take the amount realized of money minus partner's outside basis, which is going to be less than the amount realized, and you're going to have a uh, capital gain. All right. Scenario four. This is kind of like two, except um, instead of increasing the basis in assets, we're going to have to decrease the basis in assets. And so when you have a uh, scenario four is where you have a distribution of money, inventory, and or unrealized receivables, so there's, there's no other property, that's scenario five. What, what the partner does is reduces the basis in the distributed assets other than money, but again, they don't recognize the gain or loss. And so this procedure is we, out, uh, we assign the outside basis to distributed assets in the amount equal to the assets inside basis in step two, we're going to allocate the required decrease to assets uh, with unrealized depreciation, meaning if fair market value is less than uh, the tax basis, we're going to reduce it to the fair market value. And then step three, we allocate any remaining required decrease to the distributed assets in proportion to their adjusted bases. Now, that's different than two, right? Because you used, uh, your, your allocation was in proportion to their adjusted fair market value. So this is different. And so there you have your, your formula required decrease times adjusted basis of the asset divided into sum of the adjusted basis of all distributed assets other than money. And for an example of that, look at 21-19. Uh, I mean, if you can, if you can get through uh, and understand Scenario two, you should be able to understand scenario four, and uh, a good example of that would be the, uh, the 21 19. See if there's any other comments I want to make. I don't believe so. Now, scenario five, here you have not only cash and or hot assets, but you have other property included in the distribution. And so, um, in this case, again, the terminating partner does not recognize any gain or loss, but rather decreases the basis in the property distributed, it's similar to the procedure under scenario four, except that the required decrease reduces the bases in other property rather than the hot assets. So that's, that's really the difference right there. And again, for an example there, look at uh, example uh, 20, 21 21. As 
far as the character in the holding period, uh, again, we talked about the, the, the five-year taint for inventory. Um, generally, though, the, the character stays the same to the partner as it was in the partnership. Um, partner's holding period includes the partner's partnership's holding period. Um, notice that um, unrealized receivables doesn't have a uh, taint period. In other words, if it was receivables in the hands of um, the partnership, it's always going to be receivables in the hands of the partner, which kind of makes sense. All right, so that's that's it for chapter 21. If you can get through all that, I think you'll be pretty pretty set. So that's as far as we go in this chapter.